So let's start um, our next session with a teaser on digital editions with a few examples, obviously from Graz. I also have one that's not from Graz that I like very much. Um, but just so you know what digital editions look like and what some of these uh, best practice examples that I um, showed you, what they look like in practice. I'm going to move this out of the way. Okay. So this is a, a GAMS project. Mm, that I'm gonna, um, that I always like to ha use as an introductory example. It has the shorthand UFBAS, it's Urfedebücher der Stadt Basel. It's an example of one of those editions that is uh, only in German, mm, but it doesn't matter. These are just a few things that I want to point out as um, what ba best practice examples look like in practice, or some of the things that I mentioned, for example, these FAIR criteria and so on. Mm, so, as you can see in this screenshot, there's also on the slides there is a link to the actual project if you want to explore. Um, this screenshot shows a little metadata section. All of these editions in the GAMS sorry, are based in TI data. As I've said, the single source principle and the GAMS, it's the Geisteswissenschaftliches Asset Management System, I also have a few slides on that later, is a repository but it's also, it's for a long time ar archiving, but also for publication. So it is in a way um, uh, an in-between thing between uh, an archive and a publication platform. If you want to do a project with us, uh, let us know, we can write a grant proposal together and then um, publish your project, hopefully. Mm, so as you can see, there's this metadata section and this is a, an HTML-based website. It all comes from this TI data. Here's a little TI sign. And if you're on the website, you can click it and you, it will lead you to the TI source. So this is also one of the things that I mentioned. This data should be downloadable. It should be accessible. In this case, you can just click on it. There's also RDF data. We haven't heard about RDF. Sean is going to say some about it in his um, talk later. Mm, but so you can download it in TI and there's also the print sign which will allow you to print out something. And all of these things are generated from a single source. We say it's, that it's um, generated on the fly. So the system as you open the site, as you query it, generates the website from the data. This is great in terms of long time archiving because we only need to save the data and the transformation scenarios, scenarios that are linked to it. But essentially, for long-term archiving purposes, the, this um, web presentation isn't necessary. This is not what we're archiving. We are essentially archiving the data below it. And this data will often be much richer than the data we actually display. So usually people will encode much more, but not all of it is relevant for all presentation forms. Mm. It says here what the title of the document is, and there is a suggestion for citation. So this is also what I talked about in terms of citability. Mm, we want to be able to cite these sources even though they're on the internet. That is generally not such a controlled um, sphere. We want to have them be citable like a book. So essentially I always say to my students, if you want to cite an internet source, make sure that it has all the most important bibliographic data such as author, year or <coughs> publication date, title and ideally a publisher or publication place. In this case, we also have that. They suggest that you cite it with the title of the edition that is part of this, uh, like a collection, essentially. You cite this less, uh, like a book collection. It says who edited it, it and uh, it says that it appeared in Basel and Graz in 2016. And here you have a little note about the versioning. It says that this file has been last changed in 2017. And there's also an HDL, a handle. There are different forms of persistent identifiers, but this is an example of one of them. And so over here, I have an example of what this edition would look like and what you could do with it. As you can see here, this is one entry with text that has been edited, and some of it is highlighted. And this highlighting comes from this mm, little control panel here that allows us to click what we want highlighted. So 
This data is encoded in a structured format in the TI file, which will allow us to highlight it or remove the highlight as we want. We could also do something else with it. We could generate a list of persons, for example, that are mentioned in the document. We could extract a list of dates. This is also where this RDF comes in without going into detail what it is. Um, the professor here, Georg Vogeler, has come up with the concept of a so-called assertive edition. That is an edition that states facts about a text, which is relevant for historical texts, for example. In a historical text or in a charter, which is his uh, main area of expertise, there is lots of historical data, like the people mentioned or the, uh, the places mentioned or the dates mentioned. And so being able to query that in a structured way, that would be an assertive edition. So an edition that asserts facts in a way. Even though we've heard facts don't actually exist, but you know what I mean. Yeah, so for example here it also has um, tagging. The Schlagwort means tags. And essentially, yeah, if you click on these things, then it will get highlighted in the text. This is about um, offenses committed in Basel. Some of them are um, quite funny. This is why I always pick this one. It says that um, somebody got drunk and, no, this is not, yeah, he got drunk and that's why he got punished. He got drunk in public and caused a scene. So if you want to explore, there are some funny offenses committed. Okay, I think I need to exit this for a second so I can change slides. This is okay to see, right? Even without enlarging. And this is also a very interesting project because um, it's the Korama, cooking recipes of the Middle Ages. And since lots of people like medieval sources here, I think this is very interesting. It will be a great source for you to look into how people encoded MS descriptions because these manuscripts have very detailed MS descriptions. And I think a great way of learning how to encode TI, because as I've said, uh, encoding things is a subjective process. And the guidelines offer us a framework, but you can interpret it in different ways. Or sometimes it's hard to really understand what's going on without seeing an example. So this is a highly recommended project for checking out these examples. I think uh, Sean will also talk about it more because this project, there is more to it than just uh, the edition. Um, but I'm gonna leave that to him. But something that you can also see here is that I highlighted a few things. This is the same principle as in the other edition. You can have checkboxes to highlight things. So in this case, there is um, a fish, for example, and it's in the, um, in the German of the time that is not a normalized or standardized German, but there is um, data behind it to standardize it. So if you highlight this, it will say this is a fish and it will have an identifier that says, this is the concept that I mean. And you can bring it up or you can get rid of it if you don't wanna see that. As you can see down here as well, there are different tabs. So there is a description tab. This will give you a, a nicely structured, readable output of the MS description. So the MS description in the TI is very long. Uh, initially, I wanted to put it on a slide, but it really doesn't fit and it doesn't even fit on three slides. So at some point I decided I'm not gonna do it, but you're gonna hear a lot about MS description later. Mm. But in this description tab, they basically have taken that data and formatted it nicely so people can read it. There are the recipes. There's a transcription. There are different types of transcriptions here. Uh, you can expand um, to full width, that's for the images. And you also have a metadata tab that is gonna give you like a data view on the file. And the interesting thing about this is, this is what I meant about a digital edition allows us to have multiple views on the same data. And all of these views are, as always, created using the single source principle. It's the same data and we show different views of it. This would obviously not be possible in a standard traditional edition. And then I have another example, one that is not, um, that is not from GAMS, but it's uh, a project that I like a lot. It's Furnace and Fugue, it's from my subject um, matter, uh, that's alchemy. It's a very interesting early modern emblem book that also contains music. So if you're interested in the music encoding initiative or the potential of digital editions to um, 
work with multimedia sources because as you can see it's only very small but there are links behind this and I uh, encourage you to look at the edition. Mm, there's this image, there is te text, it's partially in Latin, there's some German in it as well and in the edition they also provide you an English translation that is a historical translation and a normalized version of that as a reading version so many different views on the same text but it also has encoded the music that is part of this uh, book. And this music obviously is not in the modern music notation, so they transferred it into a modern music notation in the MEI, the Music Encoding Initiative, and they had the different voices sung by different singers as different audios, and so you can decide which audios to play. So you can isolate voices. There's even a visualization that's called the piano roll. It's just a tiny link here. It's not relevant for us now, but just... Um, to see what different representations are possible of music as well. So they visualize the flow of the music so that even if you don't understand early modern music theory, you can get an idea of what's going on, how the voices um, interact, because it's not necessarily a nice. The songs don't sound nice, but people wanted to transmit information by how the voices interact. And the, this information is relevant for the interpretation of the text as well, because text, image and music correspond. So these are some ways to explore that in the digital edition, but they also have uh, an image overview here that gives tags for different images. So I encourage you to try that out if you want and if you're interested in that, but it also shows a different potential that digital editions have. So to bring this back to the theory, what did all these examples have in common? Uh, they're all digital editions and they're all based in TI XML. This is, I think, a good reason for us to learn this because, uh, as we've seen, uh, there's a multitude of outputs possible so we can work with the same standardized data format and it will fit most of our needs. So how do we get there? We first need to remember a few things before we think about how we get there and that XML is great for capturing information and for long-term archiving data in its whole complexity. As you've seen in the Korema example, for example, we have this huge uh, MS description, the manuscript description. If I want to just read the text, I'm not interested in the description as I'm reading the text. So as I'm reading the text, I get the reading version of the text, but I can also read the description in detail. So I have saved all this data and stored this data in its whole complexity, but I can view it from different views. Mm. Because, as we will see, XML tends to get chaotic because it has lots of detail. I capture all this data, it's, not, it's technically human readable, but it's not nice to read. That's why we create those editions that have different views for us to reduce complexity, essentially. Yeah, so the desired result for most of us is the view, presentation, maybe a visualization and interaction with the data as a website. For that to be possible, we need to transform the data and what happens behind the scenes is that each of these views has a different transformation associated with it that is essentially also shows the model of a model quality. So we take out some of the aspects that we want to see now and we isolate all of the others out. Yeah, and so I think I'm also just saying this because when lots of humanities people want a digital edition, what they want is the website. And so it's important to be aware that the digital edition is actually the TI data behind it and the website is, so to say, a byproduct. Mm. So just um, so you have an awareness of what you can do with TI data, I just want to briefly introduce a few TI publication tools. There is a plethora of out-of-the-box solutions to make editions out of TI data. Because, as I've said, we can't learn the skill of data transformation in this class. And frankly, you might not want to, or maybe you want to collaborate with us in a project then somebody else would be uh, handling this part of the expertise. But maybe if you don't have anybody and your needs for the edition aren't so specific, this is maybe also this dichotomy between research-driven and curation-driven in terms of editing. Uh, Elena Pirazzo, an important name in um, digital scholarly editing, has made the difference between haute couture and prêt-à-porter. So basically, Lots of people want the simple, cheap version because they don't have special needs.
but if you have more money and more resources, you can get the thing tailored to your specific needs. That's of course going to be a little nicer than the out of the box solution. But it's important to know that there are out of, out of the box solutions, which might be enough for you. Because an, also an important concept in I think all of computing is don't reinvent the wheel. Use things that already exist if possible. Don't make it more complicated than it has to be. And some of these things um, are the TI publisher, EBT, TIT, the versioning machine, boilerplate, Ox Garage, and the GUMS. You'll hear a little more about Ox Garage and the GUMS as two very different um, things. And there is this um, list maintained by the TI of resources for publishing and delivery tools. So there's the TI publisher. It's called the Instant Publishing Toolbox. <coughs> I've just listed a few links here, and this is the logo. And there's a testimonial if you want to read about it. And just as a mini demo, I put some links of their own demos and a few examples. Maybe I'm going to bring up this, uh, the detail here. So one of the demo is Van Gogh letters that has this, this very nice layout. This was done using the TI publisher. The letters in detail would look like this, and there are different um, columns. One of them is about the source, so it's the same metadata. You have the original text, you have a translation, and you have notes. That was the same thing was handled in our previous Corema example with different tabs. That gives you a bit more of a better overview. And this is another example of one of the texts of my favorite alchemist, Michael Meyer in the Early English Books Online project that um, also just provides an out-of-the-box edition. This is a very minimal edition, I would say. It's very much non-specialized um, for this particular book, but it does the trick and it lets people just read the book and have better usability than it would be with the source data because this book is 400 pages long, so the TI file is not so easy to handle. Then there is EVT. I'm also not going to go into detail. It's the edition visualization technology. There are a few examples of what it looks like. Once you've seen these demos, you can see out in the wild in some of the real editions whether that technology is behind it. Obviously, using an out-of-the-box tool will often get you a similar-looking output. So if you're looking to make something that's very individual and very distinguishable, like, for example, the Furnace and Fugue project, I would say that's a very glamorous project. It has, for example, a graphic designer that made it look very beautiful. Obviously, not everybody has that kind of money. But if you want to stand out like that, this is maybe not the solution. But if you want a cheap thing that will do just what you need, this is a good option. There's also TI Chi. It's essentially the same principle. It's bringing TI Lite to Drupal. That's a, also a system that runs behind it. There's the versioning machine, which uh, looks a little dated because it is. I think this is not being de uh, developed anymore or it's maybe being maintained, but could also be enough if that's what you want. There's the TI boilerplate. <coughs> I also put lots of links. It will just create um, a very simple um, HTML output. Might also be enough for you. And then there's Ox Garage. That is a REST-based uh, transformation web service for TI documents. This allows you to transform a number of markup-based formats to TI or to create them from TI. So that would be HTML, Tech, or DOCX are some of the supported formats. It's based on TI, the so-called TI base style sheets. These are extremely complicated TI style sheets that are hard to, um, to understand. I think they're almost inscrutable even to professionals because the TI is so complicated that if you want to cover everything, in some way, that is just very complicated. And then the result you get, obviously, the more detail it gets, the worse the result, because it just doesn't fit your needs necessarily. But it's a very useful tool, and I think that's a tool even beyond editions. I use that all the time. For example, what you could do is use a docx document and transform it into GI. That will give you like a base transformation that has all the base elements, for example. So if you, for example, I tend to use Dracula, it's a very long book, to um, 
practicing coding with my students, I would maybe put it in a web, uh, in a Word document that is a docx. Docx means it's based in XML compared to just doc. If you um, use an unzipping tool on a Word document, a docx, it will give you a zip folder and there's XML files in it. So for example, if you, um, you're responsible for handling peer-reviewed comments to somebody, but it's anonymous, I don't know if you know, but in Word, for example, sometimes it will put your name in the comments. So if as an editor, you're responsible for making sure it's anonymous and you can't get it out of there, you can go into the XML data and search for the name and then delete it or replace it by reviewer one. It's uh, the XML that's behind these Word documents is practically inscrutable, but you can use search functionalities. So this is a, just a fun practical way that you might want to use this. Mm, yeah, or for example, if you want to view your TI file just quickly to see what it looks like or to make it kind of readable, you could just transform it to HTML, that's the website format, and then look at it in your browser. Your browser will interpret the file. Which, by the way, does not mean it's on the internet. Some people think once a um, browser opens an HTML file that it looks like it's on the internet, but if you look in the uh, domain line where you put the, uh, the web address, it says it's on your local machine, just as an interesting fact, maybe. So, yeah, you could say that OxGarage offers a set of standard style sheets to convert between TI encoded XML and other documents, mostly markup based. So markup is this principle of what we've seen in XML that you have certain things um, like elements which tell you what something is and then the content itself. That is markup. There are many different markup formats that sad sadly we can't go into today. Um, yeah, but it will convert them to most of them, but possibly with a loss of content because like I've said, XML and TI have lots of detail, whereas HTML is focused on presentation. So if you say something is, I don't know, a heading, in HTML it will transform it into something that contains the information of how, like what font size to put it. But the detailed semantic information will get lost. That's why we archive the TI data that have all this information. And yeah, so in the Ox Garage, not all elements are covered necessarily, and you have no control over how exactly they're processed. But it's still a very useful tool. And this um, leads me to the conclusion that tools make things easier superficially and are great to use, but they can come at a cost, such as potential bugs or less than ideal usability, lack of control and customizability. So to customize, we need to write our own transformation scenarios using XSL style sheets. And then obviously, even if you used one of those tools, another problem is obviously how can I host it? So I need a website just because I have the data and I if I want to put it on the internet, I need some way to host it. I think the TI publisher might include that, but the others don't necessarily and so you still need to figure out that part if you want to practically create your own digital edition without any institutional help. Yeah, and so one more publication tool that's very different from the others it's again an advertisement for our own product at the center, that's the GAMS. It's, uh, the title means Humanities Asset Management System, Geisteswissenschaftliches Asset Management System. Mm, so that's an AMS for the humanities. It's based on Fedora. That is the Flexible Extensible Digital Object Repository Architecture. And that's an infrastructure dedicated to the persistent archival and management of resources considered to be worthy of long-term preservation. And this is just what our starting website looks like. This is the link. And you can look at all projects and maybe um, look for inf inspiration for your own editions or see if what we're doing is something that you would like to do. So maybe think about collaborating. So what does GAMS do? It um, provides user access through the so-called Cirillo um, client. And the functionalities are object creation and management, versioning, normalization, standards, choice of data formats. It offers a plethora of predefined content models for data such as TI, MEI, Lido, SCOS, ontologies, R-code, storylines, and so on. And we also have 
um, a set of basically pre-configured standard publication pipelines. But because it's all based on these style sheets, it's highly customizable. If you want more information, there is documentation on it. And I think we also have it in English and it's been improved to be more readable. So if you're interested, um, highly recommended to check that out as well. Um, so I just want to recap a few things about long-term archiving heritage data. So as I've already said, long-term preservation denotes the process of maintaining, curating and keeping data usable over a long period of time. That's 10 plus years. So I think lots of repositories don't even have data that old. We do, so we can prove that we actually are a long-term archiving institution. Mm. Key functionalities of long-term archiving architectures include persistent identification, so the fact that um, data on the internet remains um, has a unique identifier that I can address it with, versioning, um, support of different data formats, management of associated metadata, data export and retrieval, and security and scalability, but a special emphasis is placed on the sustainability, citability, and the guarantee of long-term access to the contained resources. As I've already said multiple times, XML is great for long-term archiving, and yeah, uh, data formats and software used for preservation should be open source and non-proprietary standards. That's why this data is ideally encoded in Unicode XML format. These plain text files are small, human and machine readable. It's a recognized standard that's stable since 1998. And we have already seen some XML and TI will follow soon. Mm. A few more examples of what I, I labeled data quality in the GAMS. This is our example project again, UFBAS. Mm. In the top image as that I've already shown to you, there's the info on recommended citation. We have downloadable source data in XML and RDF. And below we have a data view of the so-called Dublin Core metadata for an XML object in GAMS. This also ensures citability, but it also ensures long-term access. Just thinking of the possibility that this edition view is not available anymore, we still have access to the data. So this would be maybe a little bit the different views of GAMS as a a long-term archiving thing and as a publication platform. I'm going to bring this up a little bigger so you can see it. So this is just the overview of one of those metadata things. It will extract, also using a style sheet, the so-called Dublin Core metadata, the most important metadata to identify a digital object from the TI files. It has information on the data set with, for example, a publication date, last modified date, and there is information on files in this object. In this case, there's just one TI source, but in some other cases, there's more. And you can download everything. So GAMS in this way isn't an out-of-the-box tool like the others. It's something between a con man content management system, a repository for long-term archiving, and a publication platform, as you've seen in these different views. Mm, and these uh, X XSL transformation applied to files in GAMS are custom, but they're so-called, we call them whippets. That's a word that we invented between widget and snippet. There are examples with links uh, on those slides. So it's essentially standard JavaScript functionalities. JavaScript is what controls uh, dynamic functionalities on the web. So I've already mentioned HTML. That is what uh, stores the content in a structured form. There's CSS, Cascading Style Sheets, that does the layout. And then JavaScript that controls dynamic behaviors. And we also have these standard templates that can be reused. And as I've already said, as a publication platform, uh, we have presentation and long-term archiving and allowing for persistent access to the data, versioning, and all those things. One more example that's also nice that shows this uh, being created on the fly from the same data, we have two very different views on the same file. Wait, I gotta bring this up again. This is from the BR project. 
And here we have a metadata view on the XML data. We have uh, the facsimile of the title page. We have the title, author, date, place, publisher, and extent, and a permalink. And here, because this is about, um, it's about the city of Graz and about maps associated with it, we have uh, this text where place names are annotated and they are linked to map views. So you can zoom into where we are. You can zoom into what the city looks like at the time because obviously uh, changing maps are difficult because historical maps are often not that accurate and then we have to map it onto the current um, maps that we can use on the internet and so on. And so we have a very different view on the same book essentially. So I'd like to do a tiny practice thing. It's also just a few minutes. And I would like you to um, go to the website Ox Garage. I think that the link might have changed a little bit in the meantime. I think it was, it was changed. But usually it should redirect you. And I would like you to transform some data to HTML. And look at what you notice. If you have TI data already, that would be great. But if you don't, no worries. You can use any Word document that you have. Just, just try it out and see what it would, lo would, would look like as a website using those standard transformation workflows. Can I click it. Yeah, okay. This is the Ox Garage. It's now called TI Garage, the link, but it will redirect you there. So this is the website. What you would do is you click on documents and pick the one that you want. If you want to transform slides, you go on presentations or spreadsheets, you go to spreadsheets. Mm, I'm going to check whether I ha have anything here by accident. I actually have an XML file, so I am going to say XML, where is it? Maybe just try TI. And then <coughs> this, this first thing says convert from, and the second one says convert to. So I'm going to pick HTML. Wait a second, where is it? There it is. And then up here I can pick data. I'm just going to take this and hope it, I didn't break it. This is something I used in my last lesson that I taught. Not sure if I saved it to be still correct. You might want to bring up these advanced options. If your documents have images included, uh, it might time out. So I'm going to not say it. I'm going to uncheck those that it doesn't download. And hide the advanced options. And then I'm going to say convert. No, I didn't want to download the images. OK. OK, it doesn't like my file. Maybe I should check. Maybe I can just use this TI source. You can download any TI source from GUMS. Maybe that would also be a great way to try out GUMS. It always offers these um, TI files, so if you want to do that. I think now it's running, yeah. And it downloaded the result. And this is what it looks like. This is from the Korma project. As you can see, it's definitely not as nice as the Korma project, but it did retain maybe the most important things. It has a few notes here that obviously don't look that good, but it has um, page numbers, so. I guess that's enough to give you an idea of what, what it does and what it doesn't do. But I think it's a useful resource. <laughs>